together. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's question. Question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The COVID pandemic began more than two years ago. The Scottish Government has had all that time to make our schools fit for use. Why then, First Minister, are we in the position, after so much time, that one of your government's ideas to protect kids and teachers is to chop the bottom off of classroom doors? <laughs> First Minister. Firstly, our schools are fit for use, thanks to the dedication of teachers and other school staff, thanks to the sacrifices of young people and their parents. Uh, we've managed to keep our schools open during some of the most challenging phases of this pandemic, and that's a credit to everybody in our education system. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, continues to take uh, a range of measures to ensure that children and staff working in schools are as safe as it is possible uh, for them to be. Um, one of those measures, of course, is one uh, that Douglas Ross, uh, against all uh, logic uh, and most expert evidence, opposes, which is asking uh, staff and uh, pupils in uh, our secondary schools to wear face coverings, uh, a basic mitigation. But on this issue of, of ventilation, um, this seems to me... Uh, to, well, Douglas Ross is shouting, chopping the bottom off of doors. <laughs> Let me just... When, when you're trying to improve ventilation in a room, uh, there's a number of things you need to do. Uh, partly that can be about uh, air filtration to uh, purify the air. Uh, partly that is about ventilation, so mechanical ventilation systems. But also partly it's First about... First Minister, sorry... Um, we are, we are just beginning this session. I'm very, very keen that all members can hear the questions and responses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But Mr. partly, presiding officer, and this is the key point, it's about taking measures to ensure that the, ensure that the natural flow of air in a room is maximised. So if you, have, if you have doors or windows uh, that are not enabling that natural flow of air in the way you would want it to, then it strikes me as basic common sense that you would take measures yeah. to rectify that. And so what we've done is give additional money to local authorities to allow them to take whatever steps, air filtration systems, mechanical ventilation, or basic rectification of the structure of classrooms to improve the natural flow of air. It, that strikes me as basic common sense. And, you know, if Douglas Ross wants to have serious discussions about these matters, then perhaps he could start by making sure it's a grown-up discussion. Douglas Ross. I do want to have a serious discussion about this, and, and this is a, a grown-up matter and issue. And it was telling in, in a very long answer, several minutes there, the First Minister couldn't even bring herself to accept. This is chopping the bottom off of doors. However she tries to dress it up, however she tries to say it's basic common sense, it has been met with derision because it is a serious issue here uh, and there is uh, more consequences as well. Safety issues, concerns about the risk from fire from yeah. this plan have been raised. This morning a retired firefighter wrote to us. He said, and I quote, the doors in a school are essential for holding back heat and smoke should a fire start. The First Minister wants a grown-up and serious conversation about this. So does she agree with that quote from the retired firefighter? And can she stand up and tell us what consultation her government had with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service about these plans? First Minister. This is, this is an absurd line of questioning. Can I just say, first of all, uh, to aid Douglas Ross's understanding of this, uh, we're not requiring local authorities to chop the bottom off every door in every classroom across the country. But if, if it is the case, I actually can't, I'm, I'm struggling to believe that I'm having to take Douglas Ross uh, through this in such a basic uh, manner. First point, the first point, presiding officer, is this one. If a door is hung in such a way uh, that it is inhibiting the natural flow of air, then one of the options a local authority should have is to rectify that. And we're giving them some money First to Minister, do that. First but Minister, second, sorry, can yeah. I just ask you to pause for a minute? I'm finding it difficult to hear the First Minister from here. I would be grateful if we could have just a, a bit of respect when people are asking questions and responding to them. Thank you. I find it quite difficult to believe the infantile approach of the Scottish Conservatives to really serious issues. So that's the first point. The second point is health and safety, of course, apply to all of the decisions that a local authority would make about deciding which measures to take. Uh, this is about 
the Scottish Government giving local authority the financial wherewithal to do what they consider they consider necessary to improve airflow and ventilation in schools. In many of the, and actually many, most of the, the spaces in uh, our education estate will not need any of these measures. But where that is uh, buying air filtration uh, systems, uh, HEPA filters, for example, they will have the ability to do that. Where that is about deploying mechanical ventilation, they will do that. But yes, where that is about making some uh, basic structural changes to aid the flow of air, they will do that too. Uh, that's basic common sense, which is perhaps why, I don't know, why it is evading Douglas Ross. Yeah. Douglas Ross. I, I don't know why it is evading Nicola Sturgeon, just to accept this is chopping the bottom off of doors. It may be basic structural changes in the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon's language, but it is basically chopping the bottom off of doors. And to call it an infantile approach to the questions that I'm putting forward, it was interesting in that answer. The First Minister could not bring herself to respond to the retired firefighter who is no. raising concerns and to confirm to this chamber no. to confirm to this chamber what discussions and what consultations she had with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service about the changes her government are asking councils to make across Scotland. But the First Minister also said there are a range of measures in place, and some of these are much more appropriate, but they are being delivered far too slowly. So let's look at one of these, and she's just mentioned the HEPA filters. Bringing in air filters for classrooms, that's a far more sensible approach that's been welcomed and agreed by every party in this chamber. So again, asking the First Minister to answer a basic question, can she tell us how many of these essential filters her government have distributed across Scotland and how many are up and running in our classrooms right now? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say to Douglas Ross, I did address the point about fire safety uh, because all of these issues have to be taken into account when local authorities are making decisions uh, on health and safety grounds uh, for schools. Uh, the second point uh, I would make is... Uh, is this one. Is Douglas Ross really saying to me that if it is in the judgment of the people who make these health and safety decisions for local authorities about our school estate, if, if their judgment is that the way a door is hanging is inhibiting the airflow, uh, then he thinks there shouldn't be any rectification made to that. That's why I think it is utterly infantile uh, to, to do this. Um, and finally, uh, on the point about HEPA filters or uh, air cleaning filtration units, which are temporary solutions, incidentally. Th these are not uh, recommended to be long-term permanent uh, solutions for improving uh, ventilation. Uh, we have, we're not distributing these to local authorities. Uh, we have set up a £5 million ventilation fund uh, in order that local authorities can take remedial measures that they think appropriate for any spaces within the education setting uh, that require that. Um, and in terms of the estimate for the number of spaces, uh, the funding that we have made available would enable local authorities uh, to use, if they thought it appropriate, air cleaning filtration units uh, or uh, small mechanical ventilation uh, units or extractor fan units to allow them to be installed. Um, or, yes, to make some basic structural changes uh, to windows or doors, if that is what was thought uh, appropriate. Uh, and the funding uh, that uh, we have provided uh, for the spaces that need that kind of rectification, we've provided £5 million funding. The estimates suggest that what is actually required is £4.3 million. So we've built in some contingency uh, for that. So we have provided the funding for local authorities. We're not requiring local authorities to chop anything off of doors. We're enabling local authorities, uh, guided by health and safety considerations, to take the actions they consider necessary. Uh, the only thing I think that has been chopped off uh, during this session of First Minister's questions, and it's entirely self-inflicted uh, by Douglas Ross, is his own legs at the knees. Douglas Ross. They're still here, First Minister. They're still here. Uh, and I, I would just say... I would just say, this is First Minister's questions just once. Just once it would be nice to get a First Minister's answer. Because still, well still there's nothing, nothing about the consultation her government's had with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. So three times, First Minister, I'll ask you, just what discussion your government has had with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service about these proposals? And the funding has gone to local authorities, but surely the Scottish Government don't just give millions of pounds to local authorities and not not expect to know how many of these air filters are being distributed across the area. So I'd like an answer to that. The First Minister must know, surely, how many there are and how many are in place right now. 
And throughout this pandemic, there was a consensus, I thought, across this chamber and across Scotland, that young people's education should be the priority. But now schools seem to have fallen down the priority list for her government. Kids still have to wear face masks in the classroom when the requirements have been lifted elsewhere. The EIS union this week described the extra funding for ventilation as long overdue. And on Sunday, a spokeswoman for the Scottish Teachers for Positive Change and Wellbeing said this. We've had summer 2020. We've had summer 2021. We've had two winters. We've had two periods of long lockdown where all of these things could and should have been put in place. First Minister, they're right, aren't they? So will your government pick up the pace and guarantee all the serious ventilation measures, not chopping the bottom off of doors, will be in place by the time the schools go back after the February break? First Minister, is the responsibility of local authorities to make sure that they have taken appropriate actions uh, around ventilation in schools. Uh, we are providing them with the money to do that. And on the specific question about consultation with the Fire and Rescue uh, Service, uh, we are providing local authorities with the money. It is their responsibility to assess the spaces in schools. Local authorities are responsible uh, for that, and uh, we're often uh, challenged in this chamber to respect the powers of local authorities, of course. So they have the ability and the responsibility to do that. And the expectation would be on local authorities to have appropriate consultations with fire and rescue if that was necessary before they made any changes. That is how these things work. Uh, and that is how these things rightly and properly will be done. But, you know, Douglas Ross wants to pick and choose uh, the mitigations uh, that he thinks are appropriate. So he's talking today about ventilation and he's absolutely entitled to ask the questions if I was in his if I was in his shoes I might try to ask some better questions but that's just a matter a matter of opinion but of course when uh, the the majority of expert opinion is saying in order to help us as we have managed to do for most of this pandemic keep schools safely open it's appropriate to ask uh, staff and secondary school pupils to wear face coverings no he opposes that for political opportunistic uh, reasons uh, so let's continue, as this government is doing, uh, to take the balanced approach to keeping our schools open, to keeping our schools safely open. And that's the responsible approach this government has been taking. It backed, uh, according to all evidence, by the majority of people in Scotland um, and will leave the political opportunism, uh, opportunism and infantile approaches, frankly, to Douglas Ross and the Conservatives. Question number two, Anna Sarwa. Officer, today, Ofgem announced an inflation-busting energy price increase that will cause pain and distress for hundreds of thousands of people across our country. Across Scotland, people will be wondering where they are going to find the extra £693 to keep the heating and lights on just months after bills rose by £139. At the same time, Shell has announced profits of over $19 billion. That is over £27,000 profit every minute. That is why Labour pr proposed a windfall tax on the profits of energy companies to help pay for measures that would save most households £200 and the most vulnerable £600. It is reasonable for those profiting from the crisis to help cover the cost for the families struggling the most. So why did SNP MPs fail to vote for these measures in the House of Commons on Tuesday? First Minister. I will come on to the specific issue of uh, a levy on oil and gas in a second. Uh, can I, first of all, though, uh, recognise uh, the point that uh, the Ofgem decision on the energy price cap uh, today means that the increase in energy costs will be just under £700. Uh, the Chancellor, I have not heard all of the detail because he was still on his feet as I came into the chamber, the Chancellor has just announced uh, what sounded like uh, welcome steps uh, to help mitigate that, but steps that, in my view, do not go far enough. They seem to uh, offer around £350 of help against uh, energy bill increases of around uh, £700. Uh, I also do not yet know what the position on consequentials will be, but I give a commitment here that, assuming there are consequentials, which I would expect there to be, every single penny of them uh, will go in Scotland to helping uh, people deal with the cost of living crisis. There is one issue that we will have to uh, deal with in Scotland because part of the Chancellor's announcement today was around uh, rebates for uh, council tax. Uh, of course, average uh, council tax bills are significantly lower already in Scotland. Uh, on a band C council tax, uh, people on average pay £525 less in Scotland than in England. Uh, but of course, one of the other differences is that due to decisions uh, made by this SNP government, around 400,000 people in Scotland 
do not pay any council tax because we have a council tax reduction scheme, unlike the situation in England, uh, that can deliver up to 100 per cent relief. So we will have to consider how we help uh, those people, uh, because these people still uh, have energy bills that are rising as well, and we are determined uh, that that help will be delivered. Uh, on the issue of the oil and gas levy, I, look, uh, the, the position of the SNP is that we believe in fair progressive taxation. Um, those with the broadest shoulders should pay the most, and that certainly includes companies, including oil and gas companies, who are seeing rising profits. But frankly, during the pandemic, other companies perhaps fall into that category as well. We've seen Amazon uh, its profits rising, supermarkets uh, have had uh, rising profits. So we need to make sure we have a fair approach. The Scottish Government doesn't have the power to do any of this. This would be a decision for the UK Government. The only caveat I would put on this, though, is that we need to make sure that in rightly providing as much help as possible for households the length and breadth of the UK, the burden of doing that does not just fall on people, jobs and investment in the north east right. of Scotland, okay. at a time when we are trying to make the transition from oil and gas uh, to renewable energy to meet our net zero targets. Uh, Westminster governments uh, for, for decades now have seen the north east of Scotland as a cash cow. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. let us make sure uh, that whatever way the UK Government chooses to fund the help that I agree with Anna Sarwar must be provided, then it is done fairly uh, so that all companies with the broadest shoulders uh, get the chance to contribute to that. Yeah. Anna Sarwar. First Minister, one company in one year, $19 billion in profit, £27,000 a minute in profit, a one-off windfall tax is not going to mean they are going to disappear. They are not going anywhere. And also, I think it is difficult to suggest that because somehow a windfall tax would benefit people in Doncaster, we should not be acting to also help people in Dundee. It just does not sound credible. We know that over 200,000 pensioners already live in fuel poverty. That number will only increase because of this crisis. Back in September, we warned that Scotland was facing a cost of living crisis and outlined proposals for an increase to the winter fuel payment. The winter fuel payment devolved to this Scottish Government, but rather than act, handed back to the Tory-run DWP. The Labour-run Welsh Government, in contrast, did act, setting up a funding to provide £100 to help families struggling with energy bills, and now they are doubling it to £200. So will the First Minister now back our proposals and increase the winter fuel payment? First Minister. Oh. Come on to uh, what the Scottish Government can uh, and is doing and will uh, do in a moment. On, just to go back to the issue of a levy, I mean, Anasar was asking me uh, about something I have no power uh, to do. But it is, I, have no, I have no ideological objection to companies who are having uh, rising profits right now, whether that's because of the global increase in, in, in gas prices or the effects of the pandemic being asked to contribute. And that includes oil and gas companies. I'm simply saying that if the UK government is going to do that, they should do that fairly so that all companies uh, that can make a contribution do and that we don't just have another Westminster government seeking to use only the north east of Scotland because it is people yeah. and jobs and investment. So it's about only uh, using the north-east of Scotland uh, for benefit that rightly should be shared across the UK. But I am open, if that's what the UK Government decides to do, uh, I certainly am open to seeing the companies who can contribute uh, making that contribution. In terms of what the Scottish Government uh, can do, uh, let me talk about what we are already doing. I said earlier on, council tax bills in Scotland are already significantly lower, band C, £525 lower than in England. Uh, in terms of uh, the difference in Wales with a band C uh, council tax, £376 uh, lower on average in Scotland than in Wales. We have a council tax reduction scheme that gives 100 per cent relief to uh, around 400,000 uh, people. In Scotland, uh, that is not available in most parts of England, for example. But uh, on payments during the pandemic, so around 500,000 households just uh, towards the end of last year got a £130 support payment because of the pandemic. And of course, more recently and uh, more relevantly to this uh, issue right now, we have established the £41 million winter support fund, which is helping uh, people First keep Minister. their homes, helping people with rising food costs uh, and will allow support to be given to those who most need it. Uh, so we will continue to do everything we can, including passing on any and all consequentials that come from the Chancellor's announcements today. Anna Sarwar. First Minister misses the point. Things are getting worse right now. People are getting pressure on the bills right now. These are proposals that predated the cost of living crisis. And the First Minister says that you know, we should look at that tax across the board. The proposal was there on Tuesday. SNP MPs failed to vote 
for a tax on companies that are profiting $19 billion in one year. This is a government that would rather play politics of the cost of living crisis rather than take the action using the powers they have. A government lacking in ambition and failing to use this parliament. A government that stands with energy companies making £27,000 a minute and not with people struggling to pay their bills. They have refused to use the powers of this parliament to top up winter fuel payments. They have refused to back Labour's proposals on a windfall tax on energy companies. And they have refused to stop rises to rail fares and water charges. The SNP siding with the Tories and big energy companies. Labour on the side of hard-pressed Scots. People are struggling right now. When will the First Minister stop, stop commenting on the cost of living crisis and start doing something about it? First Minister. Clyde Knox, I know, I know the script was written before uh, my answers, but Anna Sarah could still have listened to my answers. I am not opposed to oil and gas companies making a contribution because their profits are rising. I am not opposed to that. I'm simply saying these approaches should be fair and equitable. That is the point I'm making. And I'm also making the basic point that I don't have the power over that. If, if Anna Sarwa wants to join me to demand these powers to come to the Scottish Parliament, yeah, yeah, then yeah. we might make some progress. But on the issue of what the Scottish Government can do, I, again, you know, I'm telling Anna Sarwa things here that I'm sure, I, I certainly hope he knows, we've actually acted ahead of other governments yeah. to try to deal with the cost of living crisis and particularly the energy cost crisis. The Winter Support Fund uh, I spoke about a moment ago that we have recently established £41 million in total, £10 million to help people who are struggling to pay uh, fuel bills, including access to top-up vouchers, uh, better support for those in remote and rural areas, uh, £6 million for third sector partners so that they can support directly low-income families, uh, £25 million of flexible funding to help local authorities uh, support people in financial insecurity. So we've already acted ahead of other governments. If there are consequentials coming to us as a result of the Chancellor's announcements today, we will take further action and we will continue to look across our budgets to make sure uh, that we are maximising the support we give. And on uh, the... Uh, Scottish Water will announce its uh, decision on increases uh, shortly and affordability for uh, customers will be at the heart of that. Average water charges are lower in Scotland than they are in other parts of uh, the UK, as are rail charges uh, lower in Scotland than in other parts of the UK. So we'll continue to take uh, the decisions necessary to support hard-pressed people, and we do far more of that than any other government across uh, these islands. We'll now take supplementary questions, and I call Christine Graham. Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, uh, First Minister, I'd like to raise the issue of financial help to those qualifying through care and repair in installing heat and smoke alarms. What can they do if, it's in my constituency in part of Midlothian, there is no care and repair service, the Council says it's got nothing to do with them, and they've directed me on behalf of constituents to approach Care and Repair Scotland, and not surprisingly, their phone is constantly engaged and emails go unanswered. First Minister. Well, we have already provided uh, additional funding. We're also in discussion with Care and Repair about what further support can be provided. I take the point that Christine Graham is making about people, uh, including in her constituency, who don't have access to that, and I will ensure that the Social Justice Secretary takes that into account and provides an update to Christine Graham as soon as possible. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over six weeks ago, an open letter signed by over 50 North East councillors and business leaders was sent to both Scotland's governments, decrying the potentially devastating impact of recent statements on oil and gas and North East jobs. Now, within four days, a detailed response backing the industry was received from the UK Minister of State. The Scottish Government has not responded. First Minister, when will the Scottish Government respond, or is this further evidence of how far the North East has fallen from this Government's concern? First Minister. Well, I think, I think everybody uh, in the North East would have preferred it if rather than writing a letter, uh, the UK Government had reversed their decision on carbon capture and storage yeah. Yeah. and actually made the investment in Aberdeen and the North East that people there want to see, investment that would support jobs and also aid our transition to net zero. So perhaps a bit less letter writing from the UK Government and a bit more action and a bit more investment would go a long way. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, President Officer. Today is Time to Talk Day, which is the nation's biggest mental health conversation, supported in Scotland by CME and the Co-op and promoted by trades unions such as USDA. Will the First Minister join me in congratulating all those groups who are organising Time to Talk events today? And does she agree that family, friends and communities coming together to talk about mental health is vital in terms of supporting people? Further to this, 
What actions is her government taking in response to the growing mental health crisis in Scotland, which is seeing more than one in five adults waiting in excess of 18 weeks for support? First Minister. Uh, firstly, I would take the opportunity to thank everyone involved with Time to Talk and encourage people across the country to engage with that campaign, to talk to others if they are perhaps struggling a bit with their own mental health, but to look out for those in their own lives uh, who may be doing so and to offer uh, that help to them. Uh, so it's a really, really important campaign and initiative. Uh, the government is investing heavily in mental health services and we need to continue to do that. We obviously had rising demand putting pressure on services before the pandemic. That will even uh, more be the case, is even more the case now. So we are increasing investment. We're also seeking to reform how services are delivered, not least for children and adolescents, and we'll continue that work. Uh, but I think we increasingly have to look at different, uh, more innovative ways of providing mental health support. I had the privilege yesterday of visiting uh, Scottish Opera in Glasgow to welcome the, the opening uh, of the, the culture and entertainment sector and heard a lot about the work they are doing uh, with people who've been struggling, people with long COVID, for example, using the power of, of song and, and music and culture uh, to aid people. So I think there's lots of organisations and people out there, uh, as well as the, the government uh, investment in NHS services, that we can harness to ensure that we are a society emerging from this pandemic, recognising the trauma and the mental health impact of it and acting in an overall way to deal with that. And it's a responsibility the government takes extremely seriously. I'm going to move to question three and back to supplementaries as time allows. And I call Brian Whittle. Okay, thank you, Presenting Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to recent reported criticism of its plans for its deposit return scheme. First Minister. Uh, the, our deposit return scheme, which of course is the first in the UK, will increase recycling, cut litter uh, by a third and help meet Scotland's uh, climate targets. Among the most environmentally ambitious and accessible schemes uh, anywhere in Europe, it will include online deliveries and tens of thousands of return points for plastic, metal and glass containers. Uh, it is disappointing that due to the impact of COVID and Brexit uh, on businesses and indeed the UK government's decision to charge VAT on the deposits, uh, that delivery this year is not uh, possible. But I have full confidence in the steps that industry, including Circularity Scotland, is taking to deliver DRS and look forward to seeing significant progress in the course of this year, including signed contracts to deliver infrastructure and logistics uh, work beginning on counting centres. Brian Whittle. I thank the uh, First Minister for the answer. But, Presiding Officer, repeated delays, the use of a private company to avoid scrutiny and accountability, a staggering lack of detail about how the scheme will work in practice has left the public baffled and businesses worried. A recent pilot by the Welsh Government of a digital scheme allowing homeowners to participate in the DRS using curbside collection and avoiding the need for bottles to be transported to the reverse burning machines has yielded some interesting results. Yet the Scottish Government scheme has no facility for this. Meanwhile, the Scottish Government Minister for the Circular Economy has spent more time announcing delays than she has addressing the public's concern. Yeah. From the outset, the Scottish Government have seen more interested in headlines, crowing about beating the rest of the United Kingdom to the DRS than they have about settling out the details of how their system will work. Will the First Minister now accept that a practical and effective UK-wide system that takes a little longer to arrive would be a better option than the rushed, ill-thought-out mess she and her Green Party partners are presiding over? First Minister, I'm not sure... I'm not sure waiting uh, for this shambles of a UK government to get their act together on anything would be a wise decision for the Scottish government to take right now. But I'm interested in Brian Whittle's criticism uh, of what he described as repeated delays. Uh, the reason I'm interested in that is that it strikes me as utter hypocrisy, uh, because here is what uh, his colleague, uh, Annie Wells, Scottish Conservative MSP, said uh, previously, and I'm quoting here, uh, and this was uh, in response to a previous announcement. Scottish Conservatives support the delay of implementation to July 2022 in light of COVID. But we do not think that that goes far enough. And she argued for it to be delayed even further. So it strikes me as a bit of a change of position. And yet another example of the utter opportunism and lack of any consistency or any principle at the heart of the Scottish Conservative Party. 
Uh, we are taking forward a scheme that will be uh, the most environmentally ambitious and the most accessible scheme anywhere in Europe. Uh, we're working uh, on the detail of delivery of that right now. Over the course of this year, we're going to see significant progress. We're going to see the contract signed. We're going to see the infrastructure start to take shape. Um, and then we will have the first scheme in the UK. And I suspect, uh, if they're out of their current shambles, uh, the UK government might still only be thinking about it. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President. Also, to ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the Scottish Government's plans to hold an independence referendum. First Minister. Uh, we intend to. Uh, firstly, uh, the people of Scotland, of course, elected this Government last May. Uh, their democratic decision was to elect a Parliament with the biggest ever majority of MSPs in favour of an independence referendum. So in line with the clear mandate given by people in that election, propriety work is underway so that a referendum can be held, as I've said, as the COVID crisis passes um, and COVID permitting within the first half of this parliamentary term. And then uh, the people of Scotland will have the choice to take our future into our own hands instead of being at the mercy uh, of a disreputable, discredited UK government. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply. And the First Minister will be aware that since the referendum in 2014, a number of promises made by the No campaign, including Mr Sarwar's party, have been broken, including remaining in the EU and also protecting the lower costs of food and energy. And so also this week, Sue Gray's report it said that the parties that the Prime Minister and his colleagues put on were difficult to justify and there were failures in leadership and judgment from within number 10 and the Cabinet Office. And that's before they met judges whether there was any criminality involved. So therefore, does the First Minister therefore agree with me? Does the, does the First Minister therefore agree with me that as the SNP and Scottish Green Party manifestos offered, that it's time to deliver in what the people voted for, have a referendum, win that referendum, and then deliver our independence from a wretched and certainly seemingly corrupt Westminster? First Minister. Well, it's correct to say that I, I think, uh, and I think I can say this without fear of contradiction, that virtually every promise made by the No Cam campaign in 2014 has since been broken. And uh, the crowning one of all of those, of course, uh, was the fact uh, that, according to them, the only way the only way to protect Scotland's membership of the European Union was to vote no to independence. Uh, and here we are, ripped out of the EU against colleagues, our will. Colleagues, First Minister, sorry, colleagues, can we please have a bit of, a bit of quiet so that we can hear the First Minister? Well, see, there's, there's a key point here, presenting officer, because independence is about aspiration, it's about empowerment, it's about taking our destiny into our own hands so that we can build a better future. And I think it's because they fear the power of that positive argument that Tories, Labour, Liberal Democrats want to deny Scotland the choice. And of course, what is, what is the alternative right now? To be governed... First Minister, First Minister, the First Minister is responding to the question. No one else in the chamber is responding to the question at this moment. And I'm sure we'd all like to hear the answer. Thank you. Any political party in this chamber that was confident in their arguments around independence would not be desperate to deny the people of Scotland the right to make that choice. And the alternative to independence is to continue to be governed uh, by parties at Westminster that we don't vote for. And right now, that is by a disreputable, discredited government and a Prime Minister, frankly, with no integrity, no shame and no moral compass. A Prime Minister that even Douglas Ross doesn't think is fit for office. Scotland can do better than that, and with independence, we will do better than that. Margo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is it really now the SNP position that pensions in an independent Scotland would be paid by taxpayers in England? First Minister. I think he should pay more attention to the UK Government's position on this. He might find uh, it gives them a bit of a shock. But let me, let me set out... Let me set out the position. The Tories are really, really nervous about this argument. You can, you can feel the discomfort coming from them because they know when the people of Scotland get the chance to escape Westminster governments and take our future into our own hands, they are going to say yes to independence. When, when Scotland votes for independence, as was the case in 2014, the distribution 
of existing UK liabilities and assets, including those related to pensions, will be subject to negotiation, and Scotland will fully pay its way in that. But the key point here is for those in receipt of pensions, and it is what the Minister for Pensions at the time in the UK Government, Steve Webb, confirmed, that people with accumulated rights would continue to receive the current levels of state pension in an independent Scotland. People will notice no difference. So perhaps the difference they might notice is that an independent Scotland might be able to improve the level of pensions yeah. rather than have, as the UK does, one of the lowest pension levels in the whole of the developed world. Question number five, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Minister whether the Scottish Government will give a commitment to keep ferry services in public ownership. First Minister. Right, I'll be very clear in uh, the commitment. We have no plans whatsoever to privatise public service ferries. And contrary to concerns expressed in recent press reports, uh, we have no plans whatsoever to split up the CalMac network. Uh, these ferry services are delivered uh, through public contracts in line with relevant procurement requirements and guidance. This ensures control over service levels, timetables and fares. And the contracts, of course, are operated right now by CalMac and Serco Northlink. Uh, the report that, led, uh, that gave rise to these concerns has yet to even be received by ministers. Once we have it, we will study it with interest. But by definition, it represents the views of the authors, not ministers. Katie Clark. I am pleased that the First Minister seems to have ruled out privatisation. Will she commit to publishing the report once she has it, rule out any parts of the current CalMac contract being awarded as a private contract, as well as the full privatisation of CalMac? And does she accept that the current ferries crisis is as a result of a failure to invest in new fleets since 2007, with over a thousand ferry sailings delayed over the last five years due to mechanical issues? And will she commit to a long-term ferry plan to invest in new fleet as part of an industrial strategy to build in Scotland? First Minister. Well, actually, over uh, the years of us being government, we've invested over £2 billion in the Clyde and Hebrides ferry service, uh, the Northern Isles ferry service and in ferry infrastructure. And of course, we have also announced investment uh, of £580 million in ports and vessels to improve ferry services over the next uh, five years. That's as part of the wider infrastructure investment plan. But to come back to uh, the thrust of the question, I didn't seem to rule out uh, privatisation. I did rule out privatisation. So let me say it again. Uh, we have no plans whatsoever. We will not privatise our public service uh, ferries. And equally, we have no plans to split up the CalMac network. Uh, so that's the position uh, of the Scottish uh, Government. And we will continue to invest in our ferry network uh, to give people in our islands uh, the service they, they have every right to expect. Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister has just said, the Scottish Government has committed £580 million to fund new ferries and port investments over the next five years. The soon-to-be-deployed MV Loch Frisa is the most recent example of the Scottish Government's strong commitment to our islands. Given the fragile nation of many island communities and their dependence on ferries, does the First Minister share my view that Labour's scaremongering on the future of ferry services is extremely unhelpful? at a time when the Scottish Government is taking positive steps to combat the trend of depopulation in many Scottish islands. First Minister. Um, I absolutely agree with Jenny Minto that it is unhelpful for anybody to erroneously speculate about the future of our ferry services. I think that does a disservice not only to island communities, but to the crews and staff at CalMac who strive to deliver lifeline services throughout the pandemic in really challenging circumstances. And let me take the opportunity to thank uh, them for all of their efforts. Uh, as I said in my previous answer, we fully recognise the need to invest properly to support the lifeline ferry network, uh, and that is underlined by the commitment I've already uh, referred to, the £580 million as part of the infrastructure investment plan. Uh, and as has just been noted, this includes the purchase of the MV Lock Frieza and will also support uh, two new vessels for Isla infrastructure on the Sky Triangle and many other important projects. Question number six, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is working with local authorities to reduce air pollution. First Minister. Our new air quality strategy, uh, which was published last year, sets out a series of actions to reduce air pollution uh, over the next five years. 
Uh, we work closely with COSLA and local authorities on the delivery of these actions and provide £2 million per year in direct support. Uh, we are also introducing low emission zones in Scotland's four largest cities, uh, supported by £3.8 million of direct funding. An additional £9.9 .9 million is available for businesses and public transport and those most in need uh, affected within those cities in this financial year. In addition, we have a £500 million funding commitment to active travel over the next five years and are committed to reducing motor vehicle kilometres by 20% by 2030. Ross Greer. The First Minister will be aware of the recent Friends of the Air Scotland report showing how far we have to go to protect public health from air pollution. Eastern Bartonshire Council and my region actually intend on removing the air quality management area covering Drimmon Road in Bears Den, which includes Bears Den Primary. This is on the basis of disputable conclusions about air quality improving in recent years, i.e. during periods of lockdown. Scottish air pollution limits are based on guidance published by the World Health Organisation in 2005, but updated WHO guidance published last year explains why limits have to be far, far lower to protect people from harm. Bears Den's air quality management area, even now, is recording air pollution three times the WHO's new recommended limit. So can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will delay consenting to the removal of any air quality management areas while it considers whether to adapt air pollution limits to better reflect the WHO's expert advice? First Minister. Well, before I come on to uh, the particular uh, important local issue, let me just deal again with the general point. The number of monitoring sites exceeding air quality objectives in Scotland is reducing. Targets are being met across the vast majority of Scotland, although uh, there are some pollution hotspots in some of our cities and town centres, and we work closely with local authorities and other partners to address these hotspots as quickly as possible. And of course, the commitment to low emission zones in the four largest cities is an important part of that. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, will await Eastern Bartonshire Council's formal application uh, to revoke uh, the Bears Den Air Quality Management Area, uh, should that be forthcoming, before making any final decision. And I can assure uh, Ross Greer uh, that any decision uh, that requires to be taken and falls to us to take will be very, very carefully considered and all of the, the relevant uh, data and advice will be taken into account. Uh, of course, should revocation take place, and I, I would emphasise the word should there, that is hypothetical, we would expect the Council to continue air quality monitoring in the area and to continue implementing the measures set out in the Bears Den Air Quality Action Plan. Call Alexander Stewart. Officer. First Minister, a recent report identified that thousands of women could be at risk from gambling harm in Scotland, and this has been exacerbated during the pandemic. Gambling can have a serious detrimental effect on families, psychologically and physically. So can I ask what the Scottish Government can do to support these women to end the stigma attached to gambling, which can prevent them from seeking the urgent support they require? First Minister. Uh, this is an important issue. Um, certainly in the past, uh, there have been complications around the devolved, uh, reserved uh, split of responsibilities here. Um, but nevertheless, the Scottish Government uh, will consider any action we can reasonably take. We'll consider the report very carefully. Uh, gambling is uh, or can be a very damaging addiction. And uh, I certainly note the findings uh, about women uh, in particular being affected by this. So we will consider uh, that report carefully, consider what further actions we can take. And I will ask the relevant minister in due course, once we've had the opportunity to do so, uh, to update the member accordingly. Carol Mockham. Sorry, thanks. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Despite the pain and suffering we know to have been felt by many who have had surgical mesh implants, on January the 25th, the Scottish Government signed a deal with mesh providers to provide more mesh surgery for the next 24 months at a cost of £3.5 million. Given we know the extent of post-operative problems with mesh, is the First Minister aware of any alternatives offered, such as natural, natural tissue repair? And given the experiences of mesh campaigners, Will she commit to an independent review into all mesh use in Scotland so we can better understand the scale of what seems to be an increasing problem? First Minister. Um, this is a really important issue and one the Government has been working hard on in a range of different ways, uh, of course with the contribution of MSPs from uh, parties across this chamber to try to deal with the impact uh, of mesh on women. I'm going to study if uh, Carol Monaghan uh, will uh, allow me to study the detail of her question there and come back to her in writing in case I, I, I don't uh, deal with all the aspects of it in this answer. Uh, of course, uh, all surgical uh, mesh uh, has uh, been uh, suspended uh, at the moment. The uh, position that Jean, 
transvaginal uh, mesh, uh, the position introduced by Jean Freeman uh, stands. Uh, we have also recently in this Parliament legislated uh, to help uh, deal with some of the impact and we will continue to take all uh, possible steps. I met uh, just before uh, the pandemic uh, hit uh, with two groups of women, uh, with Jean Freeman and uh, the then Chief Medical Officer Catherine Calderwood, uh, for lengthy periods to hear directly from them about the impact. And This Government is determined to take the action necessary uh, to alleviate that and to learn lessons as well uh, as we go forward. Alex Cole Hamilton. Much, Presiding Officer. Uh, ONS confirmed today that 100,000 Scots are living with long COVID. But a parliamentary answer I received last week tells astonishingly that fewer than 1% of them have been referred into Scotland's long COVID support service. Fewer than 1%. This is the principal government funded service for sufferers. Now, Chess, Heart and Stroke Scotland, who deliver the service, I know, are desperate to help more sufferers. But the government have yet to instruct the care pathways that will see people referred into this service. So, can I ask the First Minister to intervene and to sort this out? First Minister. Uh, th there's no need to intervene because this work has been taken forward. Of course, people with long COVID will be receiving uh, support at, at different uh, levels and parts of the National Health Service. Many people will be receiving uh, support from uh, their GP, for example, and it's right that support is, is provided on a holistic uh, basis. Uh, in terms of uh, the additional action, the £10 million uh, long COVID support fund is targeted specifically at areas where additional resource is needed uh, and where it can make the biggest impact for people uh, who need uh, additional care and support. NHS National Services Division is uh, currently establishing a strategic network to help identify uh, these areas and also support the delivery of the framework that we outlined in the approach paper that we published uh, recently. We've also launched a long COVID information platform on NHS Inform to help people manage their symptoms, uh, but also help to ensure uh, that people do know uh, about the support that is available to them. Uh, we will need to continue to develop this approach, I think, for a long time, uh, given the nature of long COVID, and look at different ways obviously first and foremost within the National Health Service, but different ways uh, with that that people with long COVID can be properly supported. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions.